We shall turn to God's word in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and read at verse 7. Revelation, chapter 1, and verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. John the Apostle receives this revelation from Jesus Christ. He bears record of the word of God. He bears witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ and to all things that he saw. And to show the glory of this person who sends this revelation to him, John declares the majestic coming of Christ. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. This is the one who reveals this prophecy to John. And he reveals the things which must shortly come to pass. Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The day is coming when everyone will see Jesus. They will stand before him, and some will be comforted forever, but others will be struck with terror. Everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. Oh, that all of us would get a view of him now, a view of by saving faith that we would truly believe in him and that we would be clothed in his righteousness, that we would not shrink back in the day of his coming. Rather, may we look to him and be enlightened and that we might be among those who love his appearing. Even so, amen. With the Lord's help, we will consider first the coming of Christ with clouds. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Secondly, the universal sight of Christ. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And thirdly, the profound sorrow at his coming. They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. So first, the coming of Christ with clouds. Secondly, the universal sight of Christ. And thirdly, the profound sorrow at his coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Behold, we all know that this means John is calling our attention. Look, he says, see what is taking place. He's pointing us to the most astonishing sight ever witnessed by universal humanity. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Alpha and the Omega, is coming with the clouds of glory, and every eye will see him. Clouds. Well, clouds are the symbol of majesty. At Mount Sinai, the people witnessed clouds around the mountain when the law of Moses was given. I should say the law of God was given. The Ten Commandments. Moses uh, recalled that event and he spoke to the new generation that had grown up. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 11, he says to the people of Israel, And ye came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire unto the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. The clouds were representing a spectacular view of God's majesty. When you see a cloud in the sky, how impressive it is. Uh, Particularly a, a great cloud with sunbeams shining through. It's an awesome sight. Well, clouds are a sign and a symbol of the heavenly majesty of God. 
as we sang in Psalm 97 and verse 1, The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice, let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him, righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. So here is the majesty and the dignity of Jesus Christ. Christ coming is a most glorious event, and he will come with majesty and splendor, and every eye will see it. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him coming with the clouds of glory. There is reference to this fact and this uh, symbolism of the uh, cloud being a, a symbol of majesty in other parts of the scriptures. For example, in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13, we read of, of the Son of Man uh, who uh, uh, appeared with the clouds of glory. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And it's speaking of the establishing of his kingdom on earth, and, and it, it is speaking of his dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. We think of the kingdom of grace and the kingdom of glory. It's Christ's kingdom. He is the king, and he has a dominion, and it will never end. He's the son of man. And people knew in the New Testament era that this title, son of man, is speaking of the Messiah, because the, the title, son of man, harks back to this vision of Daniel. Uh, and it's speaking of the coming of Christ in glory. Coming with clouds. There's another passage that John the Apostle alludes to uh, when he speaks of Christ coming with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And that is Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 where we read about God pouring out his spirit. Uh, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So when he says, and, and they also which pierced him, uh, it, he is referring to that verse in Zechariah. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail or mourn because of him. Again, Zechariah speaks about those who are mourning on account of Christ. And it's very interesting to take note of the fact that the Lord Jesus also referred to both of these verses uh, in Daniel and Zechariah in one verse in Matthew chapter 24 that we read. The chapter that we read at verse uh, 30, we read Jesus combining both uh, references in one. And then shall the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So all the kindreds or tribes of the earth will mourn when he comes, and he's coming in clouds of glory. And it's, it's, uh, it, it's perhaps the case that John was thinking of his own Savior, combining both verses when he himself, inspired by the Holy Spirit, brought both together in Revelation chapter 1. And it's uh, almost uh, astonishing to consider how many Old Testament quotations or references or allusions are found in the book of Revelation. We might even think of the, the last book of the Bible summing up the whole Bible with all these references, bringing it all together and pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, John is saying, 
Behold, he cometh. He's calling our attention to this fact. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. He is coming. So the present tense, he comes, he's coming, he's on the way. We don't have to wait uh, 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 for a very, very long time. These are the things which must shortly come to pass. He's even on the way, even now. We must remember that Christ's coming is not to be restricted to the last day. When the Lord punishes the inhabitants of the earth, it's the coming of the Lord. When he comes in judgment, for example, when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, that was Christ coming. And if you look at Matthew chapter 24 and Mark chapter 13, you'll see that the context is really the coming of the Lord in judgment upon Jerusalem. The whole context is about being prepared for his coming in judgment on account of their rejection of Christ. And therefore the, the Christians are to be prepared for that and to flee when they see the Romans coming. And, and the Roman insignia, the symbols of, of the Roman army coming right into, into the temple. Well, uh, that's a clear sign that these days are being fulfilled that Jesus spoke of. And it's interesting again to consider how even when Jesus speaks of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, he's speaking of his coming in judgment upon Jerusalem. That's the context. Of course, the words, especially towards the end of that prophecy, are reaching their highest fulfillment at the last day. That's when the words have their have the, 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 the most the, the fullest realization at the second coming of Christ at the last day. But my point is that we're not to think only of the last day. Jesus is coming. And what we know is that he is coming quickly. And there are various events which are his coming and judgment. And, and all of these events are preludes to his coming at the last day. He's telling us he's coming quickly. Nothing is Hindering him, nothing is keeping him back. He is on the way. He's coming with glory and majesty. And just as his coming at the last day will be with most majestic manifestations of his splendor and glory, even now in his coming to judge the world in various afflictions and calamities, there's glory in that. It's revealing his holiness. It's revealing that he is a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. And so, as one minister has put it, uh, the, the, or actually it's referring to the Psalms, the metrical Psalms, Christ is coming in all of these events. They are the steps of his majesty. He's coming with clouds of majesty. And so in the history of the world, we think, we tend to think that things are moving toward their, towards their end, but in reality, It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself coming to us and all that is taking place in the world are the footsteps of his providence. The footsteps of his providence. Christ is unfolding the purposes of God and all is moving towards the great end at last when he comes the second time to appear for the comfort and deliverance of his people. Yes, he is coming Behold, he cometh with clouds, coming in glory and majesty. Why does he come? Well, he's, he comes to judge the world. That's, that's not something to be sad about. When, when you read Psalm 98, this is the reason to rejoice. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he cometh to judge the earth. That's why everyone should be happy and rejoice. Before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth with righteousness, shall he judge the world and the people with equity. This is the reason to be glad. He's not going to leave his people in this harmful, hostile world forever. He is coming to judge the earth. Yes, it's going to be terrifying for his enemies, but for his people they will, they will be ha- happy and they will be glad. But even now, the judgment is taking place. 
Remember, he is coming. This is not something that's so far off, so distant. He is coming. And he's coming in his word. He's coming to judge in his word. Even now, the judgment is taking place by the discriminating preaching of the word. God is showing through his word and the proclamation of his word who are his people and who are not. That's why marks and evidences of grace are given. Sorry to say, but we live in a day when even in the Reformed Church, you have people who don't really know what are the real valid marks of grace. How do you know that you're truly a child of God? They get the impression, sadly, that all you have to do is accept Calvinism. And you're a Christian. You're on the way to heaven. That's wrong. It's a shame. So much of the Reformed Church is like that. We need to know what the word of God tells us as to who are truly his children. Is Christ precious to our souls? Do we grieve over sin? Do we have an inward delight in his law? Do we value his word as meat and drink for our souls? Are we feeling in our souls we can't live without Christ and looking to his blood every day? Do we love his worship? Do we love his day and love his people? Are we like Ruth saying, Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. These are the evidences of grace. Not accepting a creed, not signing your name to the confession of faith, that's not evidence of grace in and of itself. It may be the manifestation of grace, but in itself it's not evidence of grace. It's looking to Jesus and turning from sin and longing for his appearing. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And then, so the judgment is already taking place in the word. And uh, that was Malachi's effort and endeavor to remind the people that that God loves holiness. uh, And that is the way you know that you're truly among those who serve God if you fear God. I was recalling the other day how you don't read in the word of God that ministers are commanded to say, God loves you indiscriminately. We read again and again that God loves those who walk in upright ways. It's this modern Christianity that tells everyone, God loves you, God loves you. The word of God says he loves those who fear him. God is good to everyone. And you might say it's the love of benevolence, but it's not distinguishing love. And it's not love that should make you comfortable in your sins. God loves those who are turning from their sins. Malachi says, Then shall ye return and discern between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. When will you discern that? When will you have an infallible discernment to know who are God's people and those who are not? Well, that is most clearly taking place at the judgment day. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. When they are burnt up, it will be very clear then who are those who had grace in their souls and who did not. But it's not all about warning and threatening and judgment. Jesus will come for the comfort of his people. And the well-known words of Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 about Christ taking vengeance on his enemies. He's saying to those who are troubled, he will give rest. When Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. So when Christ comes, those who believe in Jesus, they will rejoice. They will be comforted. They will be glad in the Lord forever and ever and ever. And so John is saying, behold, he cometh. And this is a a, a note of praise and celebration for Christians who have grace in their hearts, who have the fear of God in their hearts. Behold, he cometh with clouds and glory and majesty. Oh, friends, we should lay to heart the coming of Jesus Christ. This truth should affect us. 
It should influence every day of our lives. How do we live? What rule do we go by? We are to go by the rule of the righteous Lord, Jesus Christ the righteous, the one who loves righteousness and who has explained his law in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. And that means it should be a righteousness from the heart, not external. Not just make sure you come to church and do all the, the um, duties of, in an outward way, but love of the truth, love of holiness. And you won't be complaining when, when ministers and elders are opening up the commandments because Jesus himself did it. It's not legalism. It's love to God's law and God himself as Jesus himself loved God and his law. Yes, Jesus will come and he will take vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey his gospel. But he will be exalted in the eyes of his people. And his people will be exalted and blessed in him forever. Their own dear Savior coming to them to take them home to be with himself forever. Do we desire the coming of Jesus Christ? Do we desire the manifestation of the sons of glory? Will it be clear to the world who are God's people? These are the ones whom God elected from eternity, whom Jesus died for, whom the Holy Spirit regenerated, opened their eyes and drew them, manifesting God's electing love. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Distinguishing love. Oh, but let no one think that excludes them from coming to Jesus. If you come to Christ, all of that blessedness and favor of God will be for you. And you also can say, he loved me and gave himself for me. He loved me with an everlasting love. Don't let election and, and, and trying to reconcile it all together stop you. Jesus himself calls you. He says, come unto me. And if you come to him, you will know he died for you. He loved you personally and gave himself for you. Well, what we read here should have an impact upon us to the extent that we prepare for his coming. We are to prepare for his coming. Why? Because every eye will see him when he comes. In the second place, the universal sight of Christ. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Everyone will see Christ when he comes. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, everyone who ever lived upon the earth, everyone who lives now, everyone who will live to the very end of time, no one will be exempt from this truth. Every eye shall see him. Christ will come personally. He will come physically. It's not just an appearance. It's not coming by his spirit only, but it will be himself. Just as he ascended into heaven, Physically, personally, so he will descend from heaven physically and personally and visibly. And people will not need to say, well, he's over there. Or lo, look over there. No. Everyone will know that he has arrived. He has come. Every eye shall see him. And that's what Jesus has warned us. Do not be affected by people saying, see here, see there. Go not after them, nor follow them. Verse, this is Luke chapter 17, verse 24. For as the lightning that lighteneth one, out of one part under the heaven, out of the one part under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So Christ's coming will be as manifest, it will be as clear as the lightning. And no one will uh, be able to say, I didn't see it, I didn't notice. No, it will be so clear as lightning flashes and lights up the whole sky, 
Christ will light up heaven with his coming, coming with clouds of majesty. And again, when Jesus says these words, it's in the context of his coming in judgment on Jerusalem. But you see, when Jerusalem was destroyed, it was as clear as day that the Old Testament dispensation had been set aside. Christ had come in judgment. He fulfilled his word. That was clear, as clear as the lightning. And it will no doubt be just as clear when Christ comes spiritually in the millennium that we read of in Revelation chapter 20. It will be clear to everyone what a great change has been wrought. There's a great shaking of things. Nations are being reduced perhaps to their primitive condition, so that they start again. There's a, there are political revolutions, as it were, and the kings of the earth are going to acknowledge the kingship of Christ. And there will be universal spirituality and righteousness with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, clouds of glory, as it were, fills the earth as the waters cover the sea. But as we said already, the words about his coming uh, as lightning reach their highest fulfillment, their highest fulfillment in the coming of Christ at the last day, his second coming. And it will be very clear when he comes. No one can make a mistake about that. God will ensure that every eye sees his coming. And it will be very clear because, and no one can make a mistake because it's then that the resurrection will take place. There's not two resurrections. There's one resurrection. All will rise again. The wicked will rise again to damnation. The righteous will rise again to everlasting glory. There's some people who say that some Christians are pre-mill and think that Christ will come to reign on the earth literally, and they say that's the first resurrection, physical resurrection of the righteous, and then there'll be a a third resurrection at the last day. There's only one resurrection, or or I should say a second resurrection at the last day when, when when the wicked will rise up, but there's only one resurrection. One resurrection, both the wicked and the righteous are raised up, and the righteous will be on the right hand side of Christ, and the wicked will be on the left hand side Christ will come in judgment and that will be the end of the world and all its works will be burned up it's going to be so very clear in other words that Jesus has come again he will sit upon the throne of glory all the nations will be gathered before him every eye will see him because they're all gathered before him every eye will see him it will be so plain Atheists will see him. Right now they're saying, show me. They want to be convinced. They'll only be convinced if they they see him or maybe they'll see the name of God written in the stars of heaven or in the sky, in the galaxies. Well, they will see him all right. The skeptics will watch in astonishment Christ coming. And there'll be no doubters then. There'll be no atheists. They'll not be scoffing. They'll be in terror. They will wail because of him. So John is telling us plainly, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Not one will mistake. There will be no one who say, I didn't notice. They will not be encouraged to look because they will see him then. But shouldn't we desire to see him now? Perhaps this view of Christ, seeing him, includes all the kinds of views of Christ that are taking place even now. Some will see him in astonishment and horror. Others will see him in admiration and wonder because they see him in wonder and admiration now. They're looking to him with adoration. They're looking to him with love. They're saying of Jesus, thou art fairer than the children of men. He's the chiefest among 10,000. 
Is that what you're saying? I have seen him. Sometimes I don't see him, but I know I have seen him. Saw ye him whom my soul loveth? Are you saying that? The child of God will say that. Perhaps the child of God is saying, yes, I see him now. My heart is going after him now. I love him. Other times he or she will say, I don't see him, but I long to. I love his appearing. Oh, to hear him say, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Behold, he cometh. Behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Do you desire his coming? Do you, do you long to see him? Or is it so even now you read of him, you hear him preached, but you don't see him? You see no beauty in him that you should desire him. What is thy beloved more than another beloved that we may seek him with thee? Because I don't know that he, he is worthy to be sought after, but you tell me, the seeker is saying to the child of God, tell me what is thy beloved more than another beloved, that I might seek him with you. Show me, tell me about him. Oh yes, you should go not just to the church, but to the Lord himself, that he would teach you, that he would reveal himself to you, that you would see him with spiritual eyes, and your heart would go after him, and you would long for him as well. He is calling you to look to him. Look unto me. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, you will see him on the last day. All the ends of the earth, every eye will see him. But he's calling you in the gospel. Now, this moment, look to me. Open your eyes. Set your eyes in my direction. Look away from all these other things. Look to me. And you'll be saved. Every one of you. Every one of you. Yes, the Lord is calling us today. He's, he's coming, and he's calling us now. He's coming in the preaching of the word, coming to you, knocking at the door of your heart. And all of it is pointing you to the last, final coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Every eye shall see him. Pray that you'll see him now. Come, saying, sir, we would see Jesus. Pray that you'll see him now in all of his offices, as the faithful witness, the prophet to teach you, as the prince of the kings of the earth, the king to rule over you and help you, and with his mighty power send his spirit to open your eyes and to draw your heart. Pray that he will be your priest, the first begotten of the dead, that his sacrifice, his blood, would wash you and cleanse you from every stain of sin, Come now, he says to you today, if you'll hear his voice, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, perhaps you're feeling so guilty today, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Think of that, all your black, scarlet sins washed away, and you whiter than snow as white as the shirt that you're wearing today, whiter than that, whiter than snow. Come then. That's his word. Come, and you'll be washed. Pray that you'll see him. See him as prophet, priest, and king, and see his judgments. Yes, we should be thinking about what's going on today. People have asked, and they've asked me personally, do we... What's happening with the pandemic and maybe other things, is that, you see that in Revelation? Well, yes, we do. Because it's just part of all the famines or pestilences and war that we read of in the book of Revelation. It's all tending to this one great result, and that's the coming of Christ to judge the earth. Even now, his judgments are manifest, and, and, and we should be reacting to it and saying, when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. 
When I see what God is doing in the world, my response is, God is holy. I need to turn from sin. Jesus is preaching to me saying, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That should be our response. So pray that you will see him. Every eye will see him at the judgment day, but pray that you'll see him now judging the earth. Pray that we will see his progress in the world, that he is working mightily. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. He's coming. He is traveling. He is on the way. These events in the world are the steps of his majesty. He is coming. And pray that you'll see his zeal coming in glory. Yes, coming to take vengeance. God's people love all the attributes of God. Some of them more directly cause them to rejoice. Others cause them to rejoice with trembling. He will come. And he says in his word, I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And God's people are saying, How long, Lord, will thou not take vengeance on the earth for the blood that they have shed? When you are praying, thy kingdom come. You're praying for destruction of the enemies of God. Some of them will be converted, but others will be cast into hell forever. Yes, come to see, pray that you will see the Lord come with zeal, driving his enemies away. And you, believer in Christ, concurring with his judgments as the psalmist has sweet meditations of God and is glad in the Lord and says at the end of Psalm 104, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless thou the Lord, O my soul. Praise ye the Lord. God is righteous. We're praying for conversions indeed. But we know at the last day, all the wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God, even our loved ones, will be cast into hell unless they repent. Beautiful babies, sons and daughters, parents and grandparents will be on the left-hand side of Christ on the judgment day unless they repent and believe. Come now. Repent and believe. Pray for the Holy Spirit to enable you. You will see Jesus on that day. Pray that you'll see him now, savingly, by faith. Many will see Christ in fear on that day, because we read, they also which pierced him, those who crucify Jesus, will wail because of him. In the third place, the profound sorrow at his coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. They also which pierced him. Every eye will see Christ, even those who pierced him, those who crucified the Lord of glory. That seems to be the emphasis here. And the murderers of Jesus Christ will not escape. They will wail because of him. They will mourn on account of him. They will mourn over their treatment of him. They crucified the Lord of glory. They killed the prince of life. Even now, they're persecuting God's people. And Jesus takes this as done to himself. And those who crucify him, those who have crucified him, will wail, will mourn with, with grief and heartache and bitter agony because of Jesus Christ. 
But we know, indeed, that some who pierced him, yes, some who crucified Jesus, repented by the grace of God, and they were forgiven. Isn't that what we gather from Acts chapter 2 when Peter is saying that you crucified him, you, you with, with wicked hands crucified and, and have slain him? Uh, well, they believed, they received the, the word gladly, and uh, they were baptized, 3,000 of them. And we must not forget that in a certain sense, all who have heard the gospel and rejected Christ have pierced him. And they have pierced him by unbelief. And we must remember that all sin is against God. All sin is a strike at the being of God. And all rejection of Christ, all unbelief, is piercing him. It's crucifying him. And yet, God forgives all who believe and repent, even those who have pierced him by rejecting him. So one conclusion is that those who do not repent of piercing Christ, they will wail because of him. They will be in agony and torment because all who, who have heard the gospel and reject Christ, in a sense, they pierce him. Some go on piercing him. They are trampling underfoot the blood of the Son of God. Let us beware that we do not do that. Having heard the gospel many times and we reject Christ, we're trampling underfoot his blood. We're putting away gospel truth from us. We're rejecting our only hope of deliverance from eternal torments. And if that is the case, then if we reject Christ, we will wail to all eternity. Now, the word uh, wail means uh, to, literally to strike or to smite. And so it means that all, uh, and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail or strike. It, really, it means strike themselves because of him. So they will smite themselves because they are grief stricken. Now, perhaps it's a thought that John had in mind, at least at the starting point, those who were literally watching Jesus die on the cross. And we read all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. Perhaps some of them began to question the justice of the crucifixion of Christ. and Perhaps some were alarmed and their consciences began to torment them because they'd actually crucified the Son of God. They were wail. They were mourning. They were regretting. They had great remorse. Now, there is a sense in which everyone will mourn because of Christ. Remember that uh, John is quoting Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, a very clear reference and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kinds of the earth shall wail or mourn because of him Zechariah twelve ten says and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications here is a saving work taking place and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn for him this is godly sorrow they shall mourn for him uh, as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So God is giving the spirit. They look by faith and they're mourning in repentance. So we, we, we don't want to forget that, that that's what John is referring to. They're mourning over their sins of rejecting Christ. And for them, there's a fountain opened for sin and for uncleanness. So they may, they may be washed from their sins and be comforted in their souls. And John even quoted Zechariah 12.10 in, 
In, in his gospel that he wrote in chapter 19, when one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water, and it has even been suggested that that same soldier actually repented of his sin of crucifying him. Perhaps, perhaps he was even the centurion who at the time when the people were smiting themselves at what they had seen, he said, certainly this was a righteous man. And he was responsible for crucifying him, being a centurion. Well, it has been argued that uh, since John is referring to the Old Testament time and time again, and he usually, if not always, carries out the meaning of, of the Old Testament scripture that he quotes, it's not likely that he is putting an entirely different meaning upon the words of Zechariah 12 that he's quoting. So perhaps, perhaps there is some reference to the fact that the day is coming when not only the Jews, but the Gentile nations shall mourn over their sins against Christ, whom they as part of humanity have pierced by rejecting him and crucifying him in their hearts. So remember that every eye will see him at the, and, and that's absolutely true at the last day. But in the meantime, sinners are looking to him. Their eyes, the eyes of faith are, are upon him. And, and yes, there is a great wailing at the last day, but even now there are sinners mourning over him, turning to him in repentance. And, 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 so, and so Christ being the coming one, his coming is not confined to the last day. He's coming with clouds of glory now. He's going to come at, at the golden age of the church, the millennium, the great revival of the church throughout the world. And that is when the Jews will look to him whom they pierced and they will mourn for him and Gentiles will look on him whom they pierced and they will have sorrow for him. This wailing and mourning is not just at the last day, but it's even now. Just as everyone, absolutely everyone, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some will do it by force, others by freedom, by the grace of God. So everyone is going to mourn. Everyone. They will grieve over sin. They will have bitter thoughts about their sin against God. They will smite themselves. Some when it's too late. Others, well, there's hope. So pray that you would smite yourself. Pray that you, like Ephraim, would, would, would say, I smote upon my thigh. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. And like the publican who smote upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Come to him in repentance and godly sorrow because there's a day when there will be a great mourning and lamenting and wailing and agony for millions, for the nations that pierced him and did not repent. They rejected him in unbelief and they persisted in unbelief and they shall wail because of him, Jesus it's because of Jesus that they are grieving. They have crucified him and they did not repent. They have trampled underfoot his blood and they did not come to him to be washed in his blood. And they will see him coming with clouds of, and the majesty of Jesus Christ will terrify them. He will come with flaming fire taking vengeance on his enemies. And who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? All kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. It means all races, all nations. It doesn't matter any longer whether you're white or black or whatever. It matters that you have rejected Christ or not. Don't reject him. Come to him. The day is coming when it will be too late to come to him. The door will be shut. The trumpet shall sound and all nations will be gathered before the glory of the Lord. And when they see 
the majesty of his coming, they will be horrified. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. His lightnings enlighten the world. The earth saw and trembled. Every eye will see him. And for some it will be too late. When they are dragged by the angels to the judgment seat of Christ. Even great men and captains and kings will be crying out for fear as we read in chapter 6 where we read of those who are lamenting and crying out in torment the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Who will be able to endure the awful sentence that is uttered? Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. It's the breath of his mouth that will smite the nations. He will speak, and the work is done. He will say, depart, and they are ushered into the blackness of darkness forever and the church will witness it and they will see the smoke of their torment ascended up sending up forever and ever and they will say amen for the lord god omnipotent reigneth will you be among those who are compelled to appear before christ without that covering of his blood and righteousness, to hear the most awful sentence uttered, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth and you will weep and you will wail in despair you will howl like an animal with shrieks of terror and fright and fear. And there will be no hope. Not even a drop of water to cool your tongue. No parents to give you comfort. No children to put a smile on your face. Absolute despair and rage and bitterness. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail. Because of him. The Lord Jesus calls us today. Repent. And believe the gospel. He offers you. His precious blood. He says I am the bread of life. The bread which came down from heaven. That a man may eat thereof. And not die. He offers you the gift of his grace and his Holy Spirit. The seven spirits which are before his throne. Is there not plentitude, fullness, and the grace to meet every need you could possibly have? Grace for your helplessness, righteousness for your guilt, blood Blood, precious blood to wash away all your sins. And for all of us, it's by looking to Jesus that we can have boldness in the day of judgment. When John writes those words in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, he's not talking about waiting till then that you get the boldness, but you could have the boldness now. Because he's saying, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, in the view, in view of the day of judgment, with regard to the judgment that is coming, 
We can have the boldness now. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is accepted, so we are accepted even now. He is righteous and we are righteous in him even now. As he is, so are we in this world. Now, believers are kings and priests. Now, they are washed in the blood. Now, they have boldness in view of the day of judgment. So that if you rest upon Jesus Christ, you will not shrink back at his coming. When John says, behold, you will say, yes, I will look to him. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and this is, there is glory and majesty and rejoicing in that. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. You will see how certain it is, and you will rest there with John and the whole church and say, Even so, Amen. Even so. Amen. May the Lord bless his word. Let us pray. Lord, enable us to give thanks for thy word. And, O Lord, come with power, we pray. O, that we would look to the Savior who has kingly power, King of kings and Lord of lords, who has the blessing also. He suffered and died on Calvary's cross as the great high priest, so that sinners like ourselves may be delivered from the guilt of sin, and that by the kingly, glorious power of Christ, uh, we would draw nigh, encouraged and emboldened, because Jesus is at thy right hand, representing everyone who comes to thee by him. Oh, that we would come to thee by Jesus Christ. Hear us, Lord, and accept our worship. Forgive all our sins. For Jesus' sake only, amen.